This is Washington, D.C. And in the files of the Central Bureau, there is a story so strange in its implications that it defies ordinary classification. It is the story of a handful of people who in the course of one desperate night held back a wave of panic and pandemonium. It began after sundown, time 7.15, as Flight A Coast Patrol from Travis Field was returning to base. When the nightly Air Force transport pointed north toward Japan via the Great Circle route, while at sea, the Navy and Coast Guard maintained their usual round-the-clock vigil. And from the equator to the Arctic, the radar network swept the skies with eyes that never sleep. Time, 719. An unidentified object was picked up 200 miles southwest of Point Barrow, Alaska. 727. Unidentified object confirmed at Fairbanks, Alaska. Heading south, southeast, 170 degrees. Height, 75,000 feet. Estimated speed, 5,000 miles per hour. White warning. 739. Unidentified object, 200 miles due west of Vancouver, British Columbia. Course, 170 degrees, height, 60,000 feet. Estimated speed, down to 3,600 miles per hour. Yellow warning. 7.54, first interceptor flight airborne. Point of interception, 80 miles due west of San Francisco, California. 7.55, unidentified object past point of interception. Red warning. 8.11, Morro Bay, California. Height, 50,000 feet. Estimated speed, 2,000 miles per hour. 8.15, Santa Monica, California. Height, 10,000 feet, speed 1,200 miles per hour, 818, all traces of unidentified object gone, red warning lifted. By 825 at the Los Angeles branch of the Communications Commission, reports of strong interference with radio and television reception began to pour in from the beach area. The monitors went to work immediately. Mobile units were ordered to converge on the vicinity of the disturbance. Pinpoint direction finding devices began to trace the trouble to its source. This is Mobile One, Hazen speaking. Uh, we're at Ocean and Beacon Way, and apparent strength two, uh, bearing 27 degrees. Over. Mobile one from center. Roger. Over. Mobile center from Mobile seven. Over. Go ahead, Mobile seven. This is Mobile seven. For the Pacific center in beach four. Interference strength three, bearing 39 degrees. Over. This is Mobile center. Roger. Stand by. Mobile one and Mobile seven. From Mobile center, point of interception estimated three miles north of surf. Repeat, three miles north of surf. Acknowledge. This is Mobile 7, Roger. Mobile 1, Roger. Mobile 7, Roger, we'll go now. Okay, Charlie, let's get moving. Quick, I need an ambulance. What's the matter? My husband and Pete out there in the picnic grounds just above the beach, they've been hurt. Well, this is a communications car. I'll phone it in from here. I'm over one to Central, over. Did you make that out, Charlie? Not a word. I'm over one to Central, I can't reach you. Repeat. Well, they must be getting us all right. I'm over one to Central, 
Have an ambulance set to beach at surf. Emergency, two men heard. Acknowledge. Roger and out. I'm sure they'll be here soon now. Tell us what happened. Oh, this man, he just kept coming at us. It was awful. Who? I don't know. He was wearing a suit like a diver. Hurry, please. They're hurt. Charlie, you better wait here. I'll go down and take a look. The young woman's hysteria became obvious as they reached the picnic grounds at the beach. There was no sign of the mysterious intruder, and little could be done for her husband and their friend until the ambulance arrived. Hi, fellas. How are you doing? Oh, we're just taking another reading now. What happened down there? The police took the girl and one of the guys to the station. What about the other one? Well, he's on the way to the morgue. That was her husband. You're right on the button, Charlie. 44.7. Report back to Central if you find anything else. Charlie, grab that portable check to beach, will you? Got it right here. I'll pick you up right here in about an hour. Where are you going? Police asked me to drop by the station and sign a report. I'll see you later. If you don't, you know where to look for the body. Like I said, we were just starting to eat and we heard something tracking through the sand toward us. I looked up and couldn't see anything. Then Betty screamed. At what? I thought you couldn't see anything. At first we couldn't. Then this, this guy started toward us. What kind of a guy? How should I know? He was wearing some kind of a helmet over his head. He could have been a deep sea diver or anything. All right. After you saw this, this diver, what happened? Well, we jumped up. Ed, that was Betty's husband, he yelled at him to stop. But he just kept coming. I never saw anything like it. He didn't say anything. He just kept moving in. And then you say he attacked you? Oh, well, we didn't give him a chance. Ed grabbed a piece of wood and took a swing at him. That didn't stop him. He caught the end. That's, that's all I remember. Just because a man's taking a walk, there's no reason to slug him. Besides, you don't look like a guy who frightened so easy. How would you feel if somebody with a crazy helmet with pipes sticking out of it came at you in the dark? And look. I know this sounds, sounds crazy, but there wasn't any head in that helmet. No head. No head at all. It's the truth. I think you need some coffee. I don't want anything. It's all the same to you, Lieutenant. I've got to pick up one of my men at the beach. Okay, thanks for coming down, Hazen. Hope I didn't put you out. No trouble, so long. You too. All right, let's start at the beginning. How old did you know the dead man? And his wife. Betty and I went to school together. I knew Ed a year. How long were they married? About a year. Wasn't her husband a little older than she? I don't know. But you said you and Mrs. Evans went to school together. And you never discussed anything personal with her? She did mention he was older, yes. How much? 15, 20 years. What difference does that make? That wasn't too hard now, was it? Where do you live? 629 and a half East Palm Court. Why? That's where the Evans live, isn't it? Yeah, I board with them. You do, huh? Now, Mrs. Evans is a good-looking woman. What are you trying to say? Lieutenant Bowers. Where? Yeah, I got it. I'll leave right away. Keep it on the murder. Near the beach. Keep an eye on this guy until I get back. What are you doing? You'll stay right where you are. At least until Mrs. Evans feels well enough to talk. What do you want from her? Oh, I just want to see if your story checks with hers. After all, you went to school together, remember? <laughs> You say there were no witnesses, huh? None yet. Anything missing? I don't think so. The cash register wasn't touched. Get a breakdown in the inventory as soon as you can. What about fingerprints? The boys are working on them now. Sorry I'm late. 
What kept you so long? The lieutenant asked me to hang around a while. Well, what's the score? Yeah, it looks like one of those things. Pretty girl, older husband, young boarder. Kid claims some guy without a head knocked the old man off. Yeah, don't say. Anything else? Yeah, he had a diver's outfit with horns. No, he's going to have to do better than that. How are we doing? I took a reading about 10 minutes ago. The radiation has gone out with the tide. What about the radio phone? It's working fine again. I just got a call from Central. They said Mobile 7 picked up some new trouble northeast of here. Here we go again. Hop in. Come on. Who reported this murder? There he is there. He lives next door. His name's George Nelson. Hey, Mr. Nelson. Yes, sir. Come here, will you? I'm Lieutenant Bowers, homicide. You found this buddy? That's right. He must have just locked up for the night when this happened. How do you know that? Well, he usually does around this time. Who are you doing here? I was sitting home watching the fights on TV, and all of a sudden the thing started acting up. What has that got to do with it? Well, you don't know this set. You know, it wouldn't work at all when I came home to supper. Then all of a sudden it cleared up fine. So I thought, well, I'll get set to look at the fights again, and all of a sudden out it goes again. So I thought maybe the battery station down here was overcharging the circuit, and so I get back and take a look. That's all. Hey, don't you ever quit work? What's up this time? Another murder? What are you doing here, Hazen? Same as before. Still trying to track down that signal in the air. Hey, uh, does that stuff work on TV, too? Well, it has been for hours. What'd I tell you? What's the matter? Seems to set one on the blink. Well, at least we know we're on the right track. How'd you make out with that border? <laughs> You're still sticking to a story. The guy had no head. Well, I'll be seeing it. So long. Right. Watch out. Hey. And so the communications team resumed its mission to track the mysterious interference to its source. Via accurate readings taken at regular intervals by stationary and mobile units, it was determined that the disturbance was moving in a northeasterly direction. By 1034, Mobile Center had pinpointed the disturbance at the edge of the Huntington oil fields. Units one and seven were instructed to close in. Hey, Charlie, do you see what I see? Yeah, the oil field. Let's hope our trouble's burning up. Well, there's only one way to find out. Look, Sarge, two murders and an explosion in one precinct is big news. Now, come on, you can't pin it all on the young border. Or can you? Very funny. Yeah? I'm Hazen of the Communications Commission. Oh, the lieutenant's waiting for you. Thank you. There's a wheel. You heard the man, Communications Commission. So we just kind of, uh, it deferreds happen very often. Never anything like this. It's on the move all the time. You mean some harm with a transmitter in the car? It's not a transmitter. We don't get a definite disturbance, just just interference. Mm -hmm. Then you have no idea of what it is, huh? Not yet. How are you making up? Not so good. You were here when I questioned that boy about the murder at the beach. Did you get anything more out of it? Yeah. Come on with me. You might want to see this. Ah, I see you're just about done. Thanks. You can go now. Are you sure this is what the man looks like? What do you say, Betty? was just about, only I think the tubes were a little lower down. And you still insist there was no head inside the helmet? I'm positive there wasn't. What about you? Well, it was dark. I couldn't swear to it. Thanks, that'll be all. You mean we can go now? Yeah, for the time being. Just stick close to home. I may want to see you again tomorrow. We'll be there. Come on, Benny. Kind of changed your mind about those two, haven't you? Yeah, I guess I have. Hey, we'll bring in the old man, will you? 
Don't tell me you believe this story about this, this whatever it is. <laughs> I know it sounds as phony as it ever did. But, well, sit down, will you please? You're the uh, watchman at the Huntington Oil Fields? Oh, yes, yeah, sir. I've been with the company for over 22 years, sir. Yeah. Will you tell Mr. Hayes and here exactly what happened? Walter, like I said before, I was just closing the gate for the night when I saw this fellow coming up. I was never so scared in my life. Yes, go on. Well, it wasn't the man so much as the suit he was wearing. Well, he wouldn't stop when I hollered at him. He just pushed his way right in there through the gate and, and walked right up to the tank. Now you carry a gun? Did you try to stop him? Oh, well, he was much too close to the tank. I was afraid to shoot. So I thought I might call for help. And just to cut to the shack, the tank blew up. Oh, you should see this sign. Yeah, uh, sir, can you give us a description of this man? How would you say he was dressed? Well, sir, like I said before, he wore a sort of a, a sort of flyer's uh, not outfit with a helmet attached to it. How tall was he? Oh, he was a giant of a man. Uh, and he had tubes sticking out of that thing, that helmet he wore. Uh, can you tell us what his face looked like? Huh? Well, sir, though he got pretty close to me, I could swear the man had no face. Now, if you saw this man again, would you recognize him? I mean by his outfit. Oh, I'll never forget that sight if I live to be a hundred, sir. Did you say this is the man? Wait, sure, that, that's him. Thank huh? you very much. You may go now. Uh, all right, sir. Thank you. Well, Hazen, what do you say now? Beats me. The descriptions check, all right. This could be some kind of flying suit. High altitude equipment. Yeah, that's what I've been thinking. Well, how do you explain that stuff about the missing head? No, we can discount that. These people were frightened. It was night. Nobody really took a close look at it. I guess you're right. But whoever he is, that outfit doesn't look like one of ours. Of course. He could have been dropped by parachute. You mean sabotage? I think we'd better wire a report to Washington and see what they say. All right, you can use our teletype. I took off the only place to please to be on the lookout for something unusual. Hey, wait a minute. What about the press? Oh, I don't think they know too much now. You better keep it that way for a while, at least, till we find out whether a friend is still around here. Well, if he is, I think we can find him for you. My hunch is that he's, he's carrying something around that's causing all this disturbance, whether he knows it or not. Yeah. Kill that page one lead. They let the border and the girl go. Hmm? How do I know? Maybe the lieutenant thinks that the guy in a flying suit knocked off the husband. Mm-hmm. Nah. No, no, not a chance. Not a chance of uh, an exclusive on that picture. They're making a blanket release in the morning. Hmm? Oh, there's a guy from the Communications Commission in there now. Yeah, I'll call you back later if there's anything new. Okay. Come in. Sorry to interrupt you, Lieutenant. Yo, what is it, Jim? There's a teletype cam for you. Oh, thanks, Jim. We're waiting for it. That was fast. Well, here's our answer. Looks like they never sleep in Washington. Just to contact a Major Andrews, care of Dr. Wyatt, director of the Griffith Institute. It's kind of late. Maybe I'll give him a call. While you're at it, I'll go out the car and check in with Central. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's the story up till now. We got in touch with Washington. They told us to contact you here. Hmm. Very interesting. What do you think, Doctor? When I see something like this, I understand why you gentlemen might have thought sabotage was involved. Lieutenant, are you sure there were no traces of this saboteur, this X-man, found after the explosion in the oil field? Fire the problem went over every inch of the area. Didn't come up with a thing. Well, then there's a strong possibility that he might have perished in the explosion itself. I doubt that. We're pretty well convinced this man is carrying something that's responsible for all the signal interference. According to the last report I got, there was a definite disturbance about three miles east of the oil fields, sometime after the explosion. Well, then if he's alive, you should be able to keep an accurate check of his whereabouts. Not that easy. As a matter of fact, we lost contact about three quarters of an hour ago. Maybe he realized you were trailing him and got rid of whatever he had that was causing the disturbance. In that case, there's nothing much my department can do to help you. I guess it's up to us. Unless you have some suggestions. 
Well, let me think out loud for a minute. It might just be that what we've been talking about so far, and this phantom, as we'll call him, ties in with what the doctor and I have been discussing. That is very possible. I don't know whether you know it or not, but somewhere around 7.30 this evening, our radar networks picked up an unidentified object off Point Barrow, Alaska. They traced it clear down to Santa Monica before they lost it. Santa Monica? That's where we first picked up our radio interference. Yeah, right at the scene of the murder. Well, then, if all these things tally up, we've got some idea of how our man got here. You mean that he came in some plane? In that case, somebody would have seen it land and take off again. Or did it crash? No. No, we don't think it was a plane. No rocket or jet that has been built so far can attain the speeds of 5,000 miles an hour. Particularly for such a great distance. And maybe we're on the wrong track altogether. Couldn't your unidentified object have been a meteor? They travel at a terrific speed. Yes, fast enough for most of them to burn themselves out the moment they hit the Earth's atmosphere. And did it occur to you that meteors are not very likely to travel horizontally all the way from the North Pole to California? But if it wasn't a meteor, or a flying missile of some type, how do you figure this phantom tied in? We're not sure that he does. I don't care what you say, but it doesn't make sense to me. Anybody trained in sabotage would say on the cover, this guy's walking around in a monkey suit, killing people. Excuse me, Dr. Wyatt. Is there a Lieutenant Bowers in here? Oh, uh, yes. What is it, miss? There's a Mr. Wakeman from the Chronicle here to see you. Wakeman here? Now, what does he want? Well, there's only one way to find out. Before you go, Lieutenant, I don't believe you have met my assistant, Barbara Randall. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hello. It's Mrs. Randall, Lieutenant. I'll be right back. Barbara, you know the Major? Of course. And this is Mr. Hey, the Communications Commission. How do you do? Well, I see you are working a little later tonight than usual. Yes, my husband's teaching a late class, and he won't be able to pick me up for a while. Besides, I had some work to do in the lab. Well, at least you'll have lots of company. All right. So I shouldn't have come up here. But I've got to get you a wrangle on this beach murder. And your whole department is shut up. Look, Wakeman, will you stop bothering me? There's nothing to say. If you got an exclusive story from that Evans Damon or Board, then you know as much as I do. Yeah, but that does, still doesn't explain anything about the guy without a head. Come on, who is he? Your guess is as good as mine. You mean you let those two kids go without knowing that? I don't buy it. Well, I did. Well, then you must have an awful good reason. I bet you're trying to tie it in with that other murder. All right, Lieutenant. Don't tell me. I'll get my story somehow. Oh, if you want to know how things turn out, read the Chronicle in the morning. That's right. I get in touch with Charlie in Mobile One and have him call for me here. Okay, honey. Won't you come up with anything? No, we're just briefing Barbara here. It's just amazing the way you've been able to put these things together. Don't kid yourself, Miss, uh, Mrs. Randall. It seems the press knows as much about it as we do. Well, let's hope they don't come to the same conclusions. A few lurid headlines and every fool in the country will be seeing phantoms in space suits and men from Mars all over the place. Yes, I can't imagine. And mass hysteria is difficult to check once it gets started. That's why we've got to move fast. Well, from the looks of things, I guess it's up to me. I'll be in touch with you as soon as I hear anything. See you. By 12.30 a.m., the dragnet was in operation. Mobile units patrolled the streets and countryside they covered an area 35 miles square. Special and sensitive equipment was prepared for action. Everyone on the job was ready to move on the first signal from the Communications Commission. Monitor Corona to Mobile Center, Strength 4, Brickyard at 160th, moving toward oil fields. Contact your units, over and out. Units 1 and 7 from Mobile Center. Units 1 and 7 from Mobile Center. Strength 4, interference at 160th in the oil field. Moving due east. Close in. Repeating. Strength 4, interference at 160th in the oil field. Close in. Got 
out here, trying to set this up. What gives, Hazen? The dentist area, all right. How about the Geiger counter? Thank you, Doctor. Quite a walk over those oil fields. Well, it doesn't register as far as the oil fields. I think we'll do better if we split up. Right, Lieutenant. You two go that way, Lieutenant, out here. Vince, Joe, you follow him. Come on, Doctor. And you? Oh, forget it. Right out of the window. We won't get very far. Don't touch anything till we check for fingerprints. Oh, doctor. Over here. He left his suit in his helmet. Hey, let's spread that thing out so I can get a good shot of it. Keep away, you fool. What's the matter? For your information, that's a Geiger counter, and it says hands off. I think you'd better wait outside. I just have a job to do. So do we. And I'm afraid ours will have to come first. And there's no radiation from the helmet. But look at this. So that's what's been causing all the trouble. Charlie, you know where we can pick up a lead-lined box in a hurry? Well, Mobile 7 should have one. They're right outside. I'll take a look. Hurry it up, will you? Unbelievable. Now, we all thought that this phantom might be carrying some device that was causing all the signal interference. That you'll learn that it's due to the very clothes on his body. Well, that's not the only thing that bothers me. Did any of you get a good look at his face? Not me. He's too far away. Well, I did. Unless I'm mistaken, that helmet was empty. Hey, where am I going to put this stuff? Oh, put it to Dr. Wyatt's station. Yeah, we take it back to the Institute. Right. Quite on the No, that's all right. You can handle that. A 
Any luck? Not a sign of him. The boys are still searching the ground. For what? Nobody knows what he looks like without that outfit. Don't bet on that, Major. The reporter got a flash picture of him, and I just happened to borrow that film. It's on its way to headquarters right now to be developed. Good. Send us a print as soon as you can. Sure. Lieutenant, are you sure you don't want to come with us? We want to make a few tests at the lab. I'd like to, Doctor. Would you know the situation? I've got to get that guy. Let me know how you make out, will you? Yeah, we'll do that. Sure. <laughs> Good evening, Barbara. Hello, Hello, Bill. I see we got here just in time. Anything new? Lots of excitement, but that's all. Major, you know Barbara's husband? Oh, of course. How are you? How are you? Yeah, it's a nice-looking dog you've got there. What's his name? His name? Venus. Say, Bill, I hate to ask this, but something important has come up, and I wonder, can we borrow Barbara for about an hour or so? I suppose so. Uh, of course. Darling, why don't you go and do the shopping? Here's the list. The market's open all evening. <laughs> I may as well. See you later, darling. I'll take the dog and tie her up. Thank you, Bill. Good night. Good night. I'll give you a hand with it. Oh, thanks, Doc. Easy now. Look out for your fingers. All right. fingerprints anywhere. What's all this? Hey, don't touch anything. You better put some gloves on. Our friend, Mr. X, left this suit at the oil refinery. You mean you were that close to him and you didn't catch him? I'm afraid so. That's up to the police now. Hand me those shears. I want to cut out this, this material to work with it. But I just bought them. Well, uh, here, try this knife. That still won't cut. Let me try. This stuff is tougher than nylon. Why don't I try it over a Bunsen burner? What's the 
matter? You tell me. Take a look at that weed. What weed? There's none. This material is one solid mass. Matthew. Why, well, you're right. It must be some sort of plastic. No. I'd say it's a metallic substance of some kind. Well, I've seen a lot of interesting alloys, but never anything like this. Let's try an acid test. All right. Go ahead. Careful now. We'll only take a drop or two. It repels acid like a raincoat repels water. Why, there's no reaction. Well, Major, this looks as though we were going to be here for a long time. The helmet is not radioactive. The suit is. There is no doubt. This spacesuit is conditioned to function above 63,000 feet. The human blood would boil, resulting in the body expanding to twice its size. And death, of course. I know. And it must withstand pressure and counterpressure. Also, it must be so supercharged it can function in thin atmosphere. Now, let's see what it is that is left in this breathing apparatus. Well, how are you doing? The gas in the helmet tank breaks down to 11% methane. Ordinary marsh gas? What's the rest of the formula? Oh, that's where I'm stuck. I can't figure it out. It just doesn't respond to any of the usual tests. Well, how could anyone exist on that combination of gases? You and I couldn't. But apparently someone can. Oh. Doctor, are you trying to say that our X-man doesn't breathe oxygen? And hasn't the metabolism of a normal human? I really don't know. From what we've seen, he has some physical characteristics which make him appear human. But added to them is this fabulous radioactivity that none of us could stand. I am puzzled. I think the answer lies right here in this helmet. Obviously, he needs it to survive. Otherwise, he wouldn't have risked wearing it where he was sure to be recognized. As it is, he only took it off when he was cornered. But if what you say is true, how can he exist without it now? Let me put it this way. It's like a patient in an iron lung. Sometimes one can, can be removed for hours at a time without any ill effects. Exactly. And I think the same principle applies here. And that means, sooner or later, he has to get his breathing apparatus back or die. I don't understand. Well, I've got an idea. If we were to return this whole outfit to where he left it, he might be tempted to come back to it. Dr. Wyatt speaking? Yes, he's here. No, thank you. Hello, Major. Still at it, huh? Mm-hmm. No, we haven't got a thing, no. The picture? Yeah, hold on. He says the picture the reporter took of our man didn't come out. I was afraid of something like that. The radioactivity must have burned the emotion. Hello. No. No, we didn't find any fingerprints at all in this clothes. Did you find any? Uh, too bad. Hello? Will you wait there, please? <laughs> we don't know what to make of this either. Have you heard from the communication boys yet? Well, let's hope they turn up with something. Major. Excuse me. Hold on a second. Yes? It's Mr. Wakeman of the Chronicle. He insists upon seeing you. He does? Where is he? I told him to wait in the lobby. Good. Hello? And it's our friend from the press is here. Don't worry. I wouldn't dare let anyone in on anything. At least not till we get something concrete. Right. All right. I'll see you later. Well, I guess I'd better see this newspaper man. Want to come along, Doctor? I think I will.
so. <laughs> Hello, remember me? Certainly, yes. Yeah. Nice lot of gadgets you got here. We think so. What's on your mind? Well, I was wondering if you might let me take a couple of pictures of that suit you brought up here. I'm sorry, we can't do that. Oh. Well, now, look, I got a wonderful picture of the guy running in the shack, and the lieutenant stuck his nose in my business, and what do I get? A blank. <laughs> She couldn't see who did it. Can you explain that? No. Not yet. Don't come near me. 
Come in, please. This is Mobile Center. Go ahead. Get hold of Major Andrews or Dr. Wyatt at the Institute. I want to talk to either one of them. I will do. Stand by, Mobile One. Dr. Wyatt speaking. Oh, yes, Mr. Hazen. Yes, we're still at it. Uh, lots and lots of excitement, but nothing definite yet. Have you anything to say? The trouble seems to be just about gone. We get a flash in the direction of the observatory once in a while, but I figure that's because of the outfit you're testing. Yes, Lieutenant Bowers ought to be here any minute. Of course. How long will it take you to get up here? Good. See you then. Thank you, gentlemen. Put it down here, please. Barbara. That cord in over there. Now you're going to see. I have to resort to ultraviolet light in order to show you what little there is left of the spacesuit. As you can see, it has reduced itself to this liquid and it is in an evaporating stage. The helmet is in the lab and still intact. This is amazing. All the radiation in this suit would, 
Why, it'd be fatal to a normal human being wearing it. Of course. And furthermore, our respiratory system could never simulate gases such as we have found in that breathing device. Well, then we have to assume our so-called X-man carried his own atmosphere with him. Excuse me. But as a matter of curiosity, why do we refer to this thing as a him? I thought it was invisible. Under normal conditions, yes. Yet, Mrs. Randall did see the imprint of a large foot and a masculine hand under ultraviolet light. How do you explain that? I don't know, but the human body is composed of various elements with a carbon base, like coal. Yes. Now, suppose we maintain the same chemical composition in the body of the X-Man, but substitute silica for carbon. Silica, that's glass. Exactly. Now, it is possible that the body with such a base, if it were subjected to an atmosphere foreign to its origin, might appear invisible to our eyes. Are you trying to say, Doctor, that we're, we're not dealing with a human being? I didn't say that. On the contrary, all the evidence points in the opposite direction. Toward a superhuman with an intelligence far superior to our own. How can you tell? First of all, Mrs. Randall saw that he had a hand with digits like our own fingers and a thumb opposing. That alone is a sign of intelligence. And he comes from a civilization that has developed adequate space transportation to enable him to travel to Earth. We have nothing yet that can reach even another planet in our own solar system. That could account for the unidentified objects picked up by radar a few hours ago. My theory is that the spaceship, or whatever it was that he came in, operated on the principle of magnetic rather than atomic propulsion, and that somewhere in the outer limits met with the condition where the Earth's gravity pulled it down and it fell into the ocean. And that he managed to save his life and reached shore. You really can pick up any type of communications interference, no matter how weak the signal may be. Sure thing. We were on his trail from the minute he left the beach. I never knew you carried such sensitive instruments in your car. What you told us is very interesting, Doctor. But I've got to make an official report to headquarters. Are you willing to be quoted that the criminal we're after is a creature from another world? All I can say is, we know that our Earth is not the only planet capable of sustaining life in one form or another. You can quote that. All I've got to go by is some footprints in a hand. That isn't much. No fingerprints, no description, no nothing. And we're after a killer. Has it occurred to you that our ex-man has no apparent motivation for his acts? And might therefore not be an intentional criminal at all? You have a point there. Hey, wait a minute. Come to think of it, the young boarder we suspected, he did say that the girl's husband threw the first punch. So? So that could have been enough to provoke the strange creature. And the same could have happened with the second murder. Sure. But what about the fire in the oil fields? Evidently, our man sensed the presence of some gases which he thought might be utilized in his breathing apparatus. Yeah, that could account for his presence at the oil refineries, where something went wrong, causing the explosion. Too bad he got wise to it and took off his uniform, or we'd have been able to catch up with him by now. No, he didn't utter a word. But I'm convinced he was trying to convey a message to me. He kept tapping out a code. I, I wrote it down. Let me see that, please. Doesn't make sense. Well, it may be based on some mathematical system we know nothing about. But he was trying to tell us something. Why did he run away? What do you think of that? Huh. 
Hazen must be crazy sending out stuff like that. I guess so. Why don't you try and get a hold of him? Yeah. Mobile One from Mobile Center. Come in, please. Mobile One from Mobile Center. Come in, please. Mobile One from Mobile Center. Come in, please. Hey, that's Central calling. You better stay here by the car. I'll go tell Hazen. Yes, Colonel Powell. Of course, I'll mail you a complete report first thing in the morning. Yes, sir, thank you. Oh, and I'm, I'm awfully sorry to disturb you so late at night. Right, good night, sir. He's around here, this invisible guy, he was in the car. How do you know? I was talking to Randall outside when I heard Central calling. Before I could get over to answer, I saw the door open and shut by itself. He's desperate. For all we know, he could be trying to send a distress signal to his home base, wherever that is. Well, let's hope he doesn't get through. We've got enough problems with just one of those guys. Well, at least we know he's around in the vicinity, and it's obvious what keeps him around. Of course. He's got to come back for what little gas there is left in his helmet. And when he does... Oh, please, the most important thing is to take him alive. If we can only make each other understand, there's no telling how much science can profit. I'll go along with that, Doctor. But I've got to make sure that once he's cornered, I'll be able to hang on to him. I think we're all agreed on that. All right, good, then we must see it from his angle. He's in an alien world. No doubt we are as frightening to him as he is to us. Now, the most important thing, then, is to keep calm at all costs and do nothing to provoke him. Immediately, a simple plan to trap the Phantom went into operation. All obstacles to his entry were removed. To erase any possible suspicion, the doors were left unguarded, and inconspicuous electric eye equipment was set up. All this was connected to a makeshift control board, which would immediately signal the exact location of the trespasser. Now, there was nothing to do but wait. The one road leading to the Institute was blocked off to make certain no outsider would upset the plans or interfere in any way. What's the big idea? Sorry, nobody's allowed through here. Who said so? Lieutenant Bower's orders. Oh, is he up there? He might be. Well, you get word to him that Joe Wakeman of the Chronicle is here. Sorry, bud, I can't leave. Oh, what about them over there? Hey, you over there. Me? Yeah. Aren't you the guy from the communications outfit? Didn't I see you down at the oil fields a couple hours ago? What of it? You got anything to do with it? Well, you'll have to ask Lieutenant Bowers about that. How can I if he won't see me? That's a good question. Well, it's quarter to four. Sure taking his time. Time is cheap. Yeah, well, how long can you sit on the edge of your chair like this? Over there if we have to. Well, we hope this mechanism works. It will, unless he flies in between the wires. I wouldn't take any bets that he can't. Well, if everything else fails, we still have Venus here to help us. You know, I'm certain she sensed his presence before. That's why she carried on so. Thinking about public reaction to all this. I'd give something to the press by morning. You know, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a pilot. Then after I got my wings and had 75 missions, I thought I'd seen everything. Now, after all this, I know I haven't seen anything.
Nothing to be afraid. Nobody wants to hurt you. I've tried to reason with him. I feel he understands, but he can't speak. Wait a minute. I'll try his code. I think I remember it right. Better plug in the ultraviolet light. Which is 
so the bear. Well, if he's in here, he'll never get out now. Door is closed. This is what I've been waiting for. Please, Lieutenant. This is our last chance. We have to take him alive. Plug in the lamps. There's an outlet here. No sound is coming out of his mouth. Look at Venus. She acts as though she hears him. Yes. Dog can hear sounds that we can. His voice must be beyond the range of the human ear. Maybe he's screaming. He's suffocating. lights anymore. In death he has become visible as a normal body. Thanks. 